Trevor Oldham here. So you are the founder of Podcasting You, where you help uh, influencers and entrepreneurs get onto podcast, and you turn this business into a, a six-figure business. But before we talk about that, can you tell us your origin story of how you got into entrepreneurship? Sure. So story begins about five years ago. I was working a job making $7.03 an hour, and that nice little three cents came after a raise of, of three months. I was just at a local sporting goods store, but I realized that's how much they valued me. And I realized that that $7 and three cents an hour wasn't going to cut it for the rest of my life. But at that time I was a senior in high school. So really unsure what, what job could I go out there and get? So did what any uh, sort of millennial would do is would go on Google and type in how to make more money. And, and that led me to Amazon. And I ended up buying this book. I, I got to find out the name and I, I forget what it is, but basically the book outlined the differences between the lower middle and upper class but the upper class had mentioned that they had gone off and started a business. About 80% of those who are wealthy had have their own business. And I thought to myself, well, I've bought and sold baseball cards, mowed people's lawns, really anything I could do growing up to make money. Never knew that there was actually a call to profession called entrepreneurship that people go out there and start their own businesses. So it kind of blew my mind when I was reading that and I figured, well, I should go out there and start my own business. Again, did some more research found a site called Alibaba and AliExpress. And for those of you listening who might not know, they allow you to import products directly from China. First thing I did, imported 50 phone cases. It was about $80, sold those on eBay, about $10 a pop. But quickly found out that if you sell name brand products from China on eBay, that the customers are gonna realize that they're knockoffs, which I hadn't expected. So I got all those, all those orders sent back to me, made great Christmas gifts that year. I, I really do think I have a couple more left in my closet, but that was, you know, that was the start of entrepreneurship. I, I went back into AliExpress, bought these bracelets and watches about a two, about a dollar, two dollars a piece being from the Cape Cod area in Massachusetts. They were nautical themed, built a brand up on there, worked with a lot of influencers on Instagram. I would reach out to them that had about 10,000 followers said, Hey, can I send you my product for free? Can you just post a photo of it and, and grew a brand like that? But really after a year, year and a half of doing that, wasn't really my passion, wasn't something I wanted to continue doing forever. And at this point in time, I was still a freshman in college, wanted to motivate people. I started a brand called Become the Lion. That brand grew super quickly. It grew to 600,000 combined social media followers in the first year. We had a blog and a, and a course. And, and really what it was, was a motivational based company. So when you go on Instagram, you can see people's motivational posts. And what our company did is we'd make a nice long caption under it. Um, and it, you know, people love it, but what I found is that people don't, won't buy your product. They won't buy sort of necessarily what you sell. They'll like, share and comment on, on it all day long. And about two years in with that company, I just decided it just wasn't worth it anymore. I, I was putting in crazy hours. I was getting up at 4 a.m., um, you know, going to bed at 8 p.m., didn't have any, didn't really have any life. And I was like, well, what am I doing this for? This company isn't being as successful as I thought it could be. So took a step on the sidelines, started freelancing using some of the skills I had, which was podcast editing, writing blog posts for people. One day I came across a turnkey real estate investor out of Los Angeles and, and she wanted to get booked on podcasts. And I thought, well, I had my own podcast with Become the Line. I I'd interviewed some great entrepreneurs. I, I knew how to book guests for my show. It's like, how hard could it be to get her booked on show? Started working with her. She gave me a couple of referrals, found other free, or free, other sort of freelance clients. And sort of built the company that way. And I learned that I could get someone booked on a podcast in about 30 minutes and they would pay me a hundred dollars where I would charge a hundred dollars to write a blog post and it would take me five to six hours. And I was like, wait a second, five to six hours, a hundred dollars or won't 30 minutes, a hundred dollars. And I was like, well, my time is going to be better to spend here. So I really just pushed and just found more clients at a little bit of marketing. And, and then, and then now we have a team. And so it just built up that way. It wasn't something that I already ever expected. It was just something I realized that the marketplace was willing to pay me for and, and at a fair value and just sort of just kept pushing with it. It's kind of cool how, you know, when you start things and maybe it doesn't come to fruition, right? You still learn those skills and maybe down the line, those skills are going to come about. And so in your example, of course, you, you built the brand, become the lion. And yes, it didn't amount to anything that you wanted it to be, but those skill sets that you learn of making a podcast, booking a podcast with people um, allowed you to help this woman out and other people to book uh, to be on different podcast shows, right? Exactly. And, and that was a big thing for me is, is with that podcast, I'd book some, you know, entrepreneurs like John Lee Dumas, Mike Diller, Dan Lockett, and I got to speak to those 
individuals and I learned how, what it really took, takes to book them. And it's the same things that I took over into this, you know, into podcasting you that I now run. And, and I can look back on any company that I had started, set up bracelet and watch company that I started on Instagram. I learned how to grow an Instagram account. And then I took that over to become the lion and with become the lion. I learned how to get, how to get my own guests for podcasts, which turned into, you know, now podcasting you. And, and I think in any entrepreneurial journey, especially my own, I can look at how each step of the way led me to where the final company, you know, became. And it was really a five-year journey. And I think anyone who's starting their own business, they can't just expect it to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say that your biggest asset, your biggest skill set is kind of communication and kind of hitting up people, networking, right? Oh, most certainly. I think having the network is the biggest thing that I could recommend. And even in Podcast New, we took on a client. We did a pretty good job for him. Then all of a sudden he turns around and recommends Jordan Harbinger for us, where if, if our company reached out to Jordan himself, probably wouldn't have worked with us, but became, because he came in as a referral and through our networking with our client, you know, he was able to come to our company and then that, that's opened doors for us, you know, beyond my imagination. And again, it comes from that networking and, and having those connections within the industry. So for podcasting you, things to start snowballing, right? Almost certainly. I would say probably June, June or July, 20, 2019 now, I think about, it. and really then I just, that was really when I started to put marketing behind it. And I realized that I remember there was a point in time with the company that I had so many new clients coming on that I, I had to hire people just as quickly as that I could take on new clients, which is a recipe for disaster now that I look back on it. Um, but really that was, you know, that was a turning point when I started putting marketing behind it. And then even now in, in 2020, a lot of speaking events where people are getting canceled. Mm -hmm. So they're coming to us where people go on and speak on stage, speak on stages. And they're now coming to us for our company to sort of, you know, get them, get them speak engagements, which just not on stage um, as well. Oh yeah. Right now during COVID, everything's now virtual mm -hmm. via zoom now. So of course people want to still be in, in, in talk shows or conferences, but of course you can't do it in person now. So when you first started, uh, how was it about finding quality podcast shows? So for example, of course, people who want to be on shows, they're in it to either spread knowledge or promote a product or service or whatever it is, right? Um, it's important to make sure that the show that they're in, uh, that they're on rather, is a uh, quality so that they can get press. So how do you find that one episode, that one uh, podcast that is worth going on? What I generally look at, first thing I look at is the show's description and I'll just read through it, make sure that it's going to be a fit for myself and for our clients. And you always want to read that show description because sometimes a show may look good for a client or even for myself. And then I'll find out that it's a female only show. So the last thing I'd want to be doing <laughs> is, is pitching myself or, or any of my male clients that show. So first and foremost, looking at that target audience in, through their description. And then once I have that, it's looking at their past episodes. Do they have guests or do they at least have topics with, you know, some, some podcasts will have, you know, it'll only be guests and some podcasts it'll be a mixture of guests and their own show. So I look for that, make sure that they have guests and, and make sure that the topics they're talking about are something that I feel as though I could talk about myself. And, and really between a mixture of that, I can confirm that it's going to be a good fit, but it's really going back to that target audience and off that show description to ensure that my topic is going to align with their audience because there are over a million podcasts out there and you could pitch yourself to every one of those, but it's, it's not going to be beneficial. And, and pitching, you know, pitching a show takes a good amount of time. So you don't want to be spending your time on the shows that are going to say no, you know, even before you send that pitch because it's just not a good fit. Yeah. So for those a hundred bucks right there, I mean, let's just put it this way. Is it better to use a hundred bucks and put it on a Facebook ad for your personal brand rather than having a podcast who you may not even know how many downloads it has unless you do your due diligence, but for on Facebook, exactly. You can kind of see the metrics and whatnot and see how many people you're reaching. Yeah, I think it works both ways where one, obviously, you know, you have, you have Facebook and you have those metrics, but I think on the other side, at least with the podcast is you can have your interview. And then once the interview is done, you can take it and you can splice it. You can put it up on your website. You can post it and create social media content for it. So while, as you mentioned, that's one thing that I think that hurts the industry a little bit. And that's one question I always get from my clients is how many downloads does a show get? And I always tell them, unfortunately, the information is private to host at this time. There's no way to know how many Mm -hmm. downloads the show gets but i think again going back to that target audience and looking at it and confirming that it's going to be a good fit um is generally is generally going to be your best option so i think you know it depends and i would probably recommend trying out both where one you could try out facebook ads and there and then also you could try out podcast interviews and sort of just see which one works for you 
Yeah, because I was going to say, like, I mean, at least with, with my content, the way I put it is that once I have the podcast, it goes on almost every single virtual podcasting platform out there, right? And so the more channels you have, better distribution, right? And of course, I put on Instagram, try to put as much on, on YouTube and TikTok, right? But not every podcaster is going to do that for you. So is it important or do you have this in your service where you ask for the raw files, the raw audio and video files, and you have a team that makes contextual content for the entrepreneur that you're working for and put it on their social media platforms. So what we do with that is we actually walk our client. So we don't do it for our clients. We more work as a consultant. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that we get the raw footage for them. And then we, we watch videos. Um, I believe his name was Kevin Anson. He has some great videos on how to take content, how to take video content um, and really put it out there on social media. So I recommend checking out him. So we basically use what he, what he says on how to take your video content, you know, you, and chopping it up to put it on Instagram, going to rev.com and, and adding the subtitles, making it, you know, making it nice and pretty. So we consult our clients on how to do that. I did at one time offer it as a service to my clients and they didn't seem that interested in paying extra for it. Um, mm -hmm. So it was sort of one of those things where I was like, I don't want to just do it for free because obviously it's going to take our time and, and money to do that. Um, but more, we, we just consult our, our clients and then generally it's going to be someone from their own team that goes out there and then does it for them and posts on their social media. Okay. And at, at this point, is everything now word of mouth or do you kind of have inbound leads for your service? Um, so it works a little bit. So one, we do inbound leads. You know, a lot of people come in through just hearing me on podcast interviews from just seeing our company, you know, SEO purposes going on Google typing and how to get booked on a podcast and, and coming to our company through there. We do a lot with referrals. We have an affiliate program set up for all of our clients. So once we work with them, we feel as though we've done a good job for them. We'll offer our, our affiliates or, or referral program to them. So that works like that. And then also we do a lot of cold email marketing. We find, we found that that's another avenue for getting clients. And the way that we structure that is we'll go to a podcast, say um, the bigger pockets podcast as an example, because we work with a lot of real estate investors. We'll go to that show and we'll go on there and we'll email every single guest that's ever been on that show and say, Hey, we heard you on the bigger pockets podcast. If you want to get on other real estate investing podcasts, that's exactly what our company does. This is how we can help you book a call with our team. And that's how we structure those calls. And I think typically work out well, you know, it's probably, it's honestly probably a 50, 50 split between referrals and then doing the cold emailing and getting people to come in, but doing cold emailing, it's not all it's cracked up to be. There's, I've had a lot of calls doing that where people hop on and like, like even today I saw a guy that was supposed to hop on a call with me and I told him, you know, it's probably not going to be a fit for our services before we even hopped on. He was like, Oh, you know, thanks for letting me know. It's like, I didn't even know I was going to have to pay for this. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so you run into people like that with cold emailing, but definitely the referrals, you know, coming in as a warm lead is, is very nice and a lot going to be a lot easier to close for your business. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the trend of podcasting and how big is it or how big is it going to be in the next few years, next five, 10 years? Oh, I think it's, I think it's really good for the industry. I can tell you when I started podcasting you three years ago, it was a lot easier to get people mm -hmm. on podcasts. You know, if I sent out say 20 pitches for a client, I would probably get 15 yeses. Cause no one was really trying to get back, trying to get booked on podcasts now. Now, if I send 20 pitches out and I get eight responses, you know, that's almost considered a win in my book. So I think it's good that there's more competition of people wanting to get on podcasts. And then two, there's also been a massive influx of podcasts that are out there, but I think not all podcasts are created equal. So if someone's going out there and thinking that they can just throw a podcast together and sort of make it an infomercial, it's not going to be worth your while. But if you want to have a podcast and you want to provide value to people, if you want them to learn from you, then yes, it's going to be worth your while. And I think that those are the podcasts that are going to stand out. I think the industry might be running into a little bit problem with these big corporations that just want to start a podcast because it's what everyone's doing. Everyone's starting a podcast. Every brand has a podcast where Again, you know, not all podcasts are going to be created equal. So I think it, there is some limitations there. But again, if you can start a podcast and you're providing value to your listeners, you're providing great content for them, then I think, again, that's going to allow you to stand out than some of these companies that are just throwing it up there because that's what everyone's doing. And they think they're going to make some easy money from it. For sure. And I think, yeah, like you said, there's more and more uh, podcasters coming about, but it is really tough to first. I mean, I've been doing it for the past six months and I've been reading some stats on it where, you know, you can be very discouraged kind of like with YouTubers today or in general, just content creators where they expect for that one viral moment to, mm -hmm. to pop off and maybe they don't even get it in six months to a year. And it's really as a content creator, it's all about being consistent and waiting for that right time. But of course there's tactics that you can implement to grow any, any platform, hence, you know, Facebook ads or collaborations, et cetera. 
Exactly. And I think that's a big thing for anyone in business is one is, you know, taking like a podcast interview that you do, you can take it, you can put it out there on YouTube, you can put it out there on Facebook, you know, and then splice it up and put it on Instagram. So there's multiple forms of content. And the more, I think the more forms of content that you put out there for your, as an example, for your podcast, the more views it's going to get, the more people you're going to attract. And again, it's leveraging the people. If you have a podcast and you're doing interviews, when you have an interview with someone, once it goes live, like send them over material so that they can share it with their audience, send them over material so that they can share it with their email list and make it as simple as possible for them to share with your audience. And it's almost like you're piggybacking off that person. If you're starting off and you have, you know, you don't have that much, you know, not that big of a following, but you have someone that came on your show and they have 50,000 people on their email list. And all of a sudden they send out their interview that you did with them to that, you know, that's going to attract a lot of people to you. And you're sort of piggybacking off their audience, which again, can help you really grow. For sure. So let's kind of still go along the tangent of your entrepreneurial journey. So you told me prior to the podcast um, that you paid off over $94,000 in in college debt, right? Correct. Now, was that through your other businesses, including this one, or primarily uh, podcast to you? So it was primarily podcasting you. So I graduated college in May of 2019 um, and then kind of just put off looking at my student loans until September 2019 and then really just kicked it into kicked it into a high gear um, and then was really just trying to get it paid off in about a three to five year period. And then once I realized that I could, I was like, maybe I could get it done before my 24th birthday, which is in February. But then all of a sudden I kept paying down and and putting as basically as much money as possible as uh, I could put down on it outside of my expenses. And all of a sudden I looked up and I was like, wait a second, I could, I could probably get this paid off in September. And and it was crazy when I made my final payment was September 30th of 2020. And the first payment I ever made on my loans was September 30th, 2019. So it was literally exactly one year, which was pretty crazy to me. Now, let me ask you this, because a lot of business owners or a lot of entrepreneurs can agree on this, where of course it can be in massive debt or whatever, but they'd rather reinvest in the business so that their business can grow and grow and grow. And then at some point they can still uh, get 10, 20% of uh, income or salary from their actual business. Uh, yet, yes, they'll still be in debt, but the point is they can reinvest that money back in their business and grow it even more. Now, why didn't you think about taking that approach? I think for me, it was a couple of things. One, I have a brother and sister who are 30 and 31, and they both came out with quite a bit in student loan debt as well. And and they're still paying off their loans. And I realized that I didn't want to be 30 and paying my student loans. I was just more of a personal choice. And Mm. it was really, for me, it was like, if I could just suck it up for one year and just throw as much money as I could to it. Yeah, this year is going to suck basically every client that that I took on. I, it's almost like I worked for them for free in, in essence, because the money just went to my student loans and, and to my employees. But for me, it was more just, let's just see what happens and just throw all the money on it. And then I know, and then I knew that after one year, I'd be in a much better position where if I wanted to invest in my company, I'd be better off. So I th- obviously there's, there's trade-offs, but for me, I, I'm a lot of, I'm very risk adverse. So I knew that if I wanted to, you know, fully run this business, you know, let's say anything happened for whatever reason, the podcast industry went down or people stopped listening or all of a sudden I couldn't get any more new clients. And, and I had this 90,000, you know, dollars hanging over my head, you know, that would be very scary to me where now I feel a lot more comfortable having paid it off knowing, you know, now I'm able to save up a lot more for my business and God forbid anything happens. I'm going to be okay. So it was more just, just really just sucking it up and realizing that I'm going to be in a much better place where now every client that comes in, I'm able to save up that full amount. And again, you know, one year later, I'm able to invest a lot more. I'm able to invest into my business now. So I think it was more of a personal choice and really realizing that I just didn't want to be in debt, um, especially just looking at my brother and sister and, mm-hmm. and sort of still how much they owe being so far removed from college. For sure. Now let's kind of break down your, your business. So the first step, do you think, I mean, let me know if I'm wrong here, is to find a person, influencer, entrepreneur who wants to get some PR, right? Via, via po- a podcast, right? Is the first step is to go to, you know, an event, a meeting. I mean, of course we can't do that physically, but this is really networking with people. So you can kind of give them the opportunity to go on a podcast. Correct. So definitely just looking out there, you know, even tell, even joining like um, webinars online, you know, teleconferences, like anything like that. I've even run ads on on podcasts themselves, on entrepreneurial podcasts, and and then putting our company out there. So obviously, it's a little bit different this year. But again, just getting our name out there and then being able to meet these people um, is definitely one of the first steps we we do into trying to get new clients for the company. Okay, and then once you find that person, uh, what's kind of your step by step process of finding podcasts? So one, the step by step is 
is generally we work with them when we have them fill out sort of like a questionnaire where it goes into a lot of details. Typically the number one is going to be what's their target audience, who they want to speak to. And then from there on our end, we use a couple of tools. One's called listennotes.com. And we also use another tool called podcast clout. And between the two of those, we're able to research podcasts that are already out there. And we've been able to build up these databases on the back end um, that we'll go through. So we'll basically take their target audience and we'll hone it down to a couple of keywords and we'll search through the database. We'll search through those two websites and just pull as many podcasts as we can, put them into sort of a database for the client, typically like to be between 75 to 100 shows to make sure that our company feels confident. And then we just pass it back to the client. So really, I just sort of having them fill out those questions because you know, a lot of times I'll work with a client and I think that they want to talk to this audience, but then when they fill out these questions, they wanted to talk to an entirely different audience. And I found that that by asking clients these questions, it makes it a lot better so that I don't spend time, you know, to build a database for a client probably takes about three to five hours from our team. You know, I don't want to spend that time to only to have a client be like, yeah, actually, I don't want to talk to real estate investors. I want to talk to entrepreneurs. And it's like, well, that sucks. <laughs> you know, that's, that's time we're not going to get back. That's money that we're not going to get back. So really, it really mm -hmm. starts with them filling out that questionnaire and honing in on that target audience. Got it. And so once the podcast is over, you get the raw files and then the person that or your client is not responsible for clipping those things up and doing whatever they want with the content, right? Yep, correct. So we'll just get that form and, and we'll pass it back to them. And, and then generally they can do um, whatever they want. Some clients, you know, they're just like, you know, thanks for letting me know that I went live. And then other clients actually take it and use more form of content. I would probably say it's about a 50-50 split on the people that actually use it on social media versus the people that are just happy that, that it went live. Now what's like the lifetime value of one of your clients? Like do, do you kind of have recurring podcasts or is that a strategy that you have? Like it's not just a one and done thing. If you can get them on more podcasts better, right? Yeah, most certainly. So the way that we actually structured it now, um, and I guess this is part of the story with the student loans too, is, is back in March. So previously we worked as a pay as you go service. So you came to us, we got your book on a podcast interview you had your interview and you paid our company. And I realized that there are too many clients coming to us that would do five to six interviews and then they would sort of disappear. Or there are people that wouldn't even get booked on one podcast. Like they would come to us, we would set everything up for them, then they would disappear. And I realized that it just wasn't profitable for the company. So I said, I'm going to package everything up. I'm going to charge, you know, more of a high ticket item, which is, which is now between three to $5,000 for our services. And so it consists of like 10 podcasts for 3K and, and 20 podcasts for 5K. And by doing that, made it a lot easier for our company to increase the revenue, help me, help me pay down my student loans quicker. And we found that a lot of the times clients will do the podcast package and then they'll just continue it on with us. Um, they'll do a 20 podcast package, test it out, or even a 10 podcast package. And then they'll come back to us and then want to do another session with us, um, you know, just continuing it on. And we just continue on that monthly payment mm -hmm. plan that we have with them. Um, and then we also have clients that come to us, they'll do 10 podcasts with us, then they'll be super busy. We won't hear from them for about three to four months and then they'll come back to us and, and we'll work with them again. But it's tip, I would say probably about 50% of the clients that we work with do re-up their package, which it's a lot easier having them re-up and working with them than it is going out there and finding new clients. Um, so I think it's always nice when we have those people that, that do re-up with us. Um, it makes our job a lot easier. So originally you only had one individual podcast. You didn't have the package, right? Yep, correct. So yeah, that's, so when you did this, you started out by yourself and then at what point did you hire a team? So the first year in about the end of the year, I realized like, um, I just didn't really enjoy pitching people to podcasts. I, I knew people <laughs> would, would pay me good money um, for it. And I was like, I don't want to do this forever. So I just used Upwork freelancing website, put a job out there. I want to say like for an executive assistant, brought her on and basically taught her everything I did, created tutorials, walked her through really everything. And then I handed it off to her. And then all of a sudden I realized, wow, like she can handle all the work. She can handle all the pitching. And all I really got to do is focus on setting the client up. That's, that's pretty cool. And then I realized like I can spend my time just really just focusing on getting new clients and then, then handing it off to her. Obviously I wanted to grow the company in order to do that. You know, I couldn't give her like 30 clients cause I would just overwhelm her and it wouldn't be a good situation. So as the company grew, then I started to hire more employees from there, but really it was just, I didn't want to just send podcast pitches for people all day long. But if I could find team members to do it and people that were wanted to do it, I'd be more than happy to hire them. And it really grew the company that way. Mm -hmm. I just realized that, I mean, even though the entrepreneur is getting a lot of value through their package, like five podcasts, 10 podcasts, 20 podcasts, whatever it is, you know, not a lot of 
upcoming entrepreneurs can afford that. So is your you know, kind of your ideal client are entrepreneurs who are already very, very successful? Yep. So typically we'll work, we'll work with someone that is already making at least six figures in their business mm-hmm. to seven figures in their business on, you know, typically on the higher end. And the way that we do that is one, you know, it's taken me three years to really perfect the process of, of finding shows and, and setting pitches. So at the end of the day, I really wanted to value my time and then what we're charging. And, and I'll get people that come to me and they'll complain and say, Oh, your, your prices are too high. And I'll be like, you know, you're paying for three years of my experience. You're paying for my team's experience. You know, you can go out and you can do this yourself. It's, it's not going to be the most exciting thing in the world. It's going to take a lot of your time. You know, you don't, you might not know how to craft pitches. So to those people, you know, I said, you can go out there and, and anyone can get themselves booked on podcasts. It's, you know, there's enough podcasts out there. If you send enough pitches, someone's going to say, yes, I, I want to have you on my show, but really our services come in. If you want that more tailored, if you value your time, if you don't want to just be sitting there behind a computer, sending out podcast pitches all day, our, our team can really help you out with that. And again, you know, if someone is just starting off and they can't afford our services, you know, they're probably not going to see a return on investment working with our company because we really want to place people on podcasts that are, that are well-known that have been out a while and that sort of thing. And it's going to be a lot harder if someone's one year into the business trying to place them on these shows that are out there when there's these shows are getting pitched with clients that have a lot more experience. So again, you know, I probably wouldn't want to take on anyone that really couldn't afford our services because generally they're not going to be in a place in their business where it's going to be easy to get them booked on these shows. For sure. And did you, I mean, as a business owner, how much do you look at competition and, or do you just focus entirely on your business, trying to make your systems, your processes a lot better? And yes, you can kind of look at your competition, but not religiously. So I think like every once in a while, I'll check out my competition, sort of see what they're doing. I, I think early on, as I was growing the company, I wanted to see how they were, how they were working, how they operated, um, you know, on that end. But really, it's just for us sticking to what our company can do and, and sort of seeing what works. But really for our company, it comes down to, are we getting, book, are we getting book, clients booked on shows in an adequate amount of time? Are we fulfilling their podcast packages in an adequate amount of time? And then our host liking the pitch, if we send a pitch out, um, and a host says, no, I don't want to have your client on, you know, what went wrong versus if we send out a pitch and the host says, yes, you know, you know, you was very personal. I, I really loved it. Then we know we're doing a good job for the client. And I realized that, you know, I don't know if our, I don't know if our competition is doing that. And I've had calls with people and they'll say, you know, how, you know, why are you different from company X, you know, so-and-so. And I, and I always like to tell them I've never worked with them. So I can't tell you whether they're not, they're good or bad, but I can tell you what our company does and how we'd be able to help you. And I think that really focusing on what our company can do, because I think in any industry, you're going to have competitors. It's going to be normal. There's going to be people that are going to charge a higher price than you, lower price than you. Um, it really just comes down to what you can do. Are you making enough money that allows you to feel profitable, allows you to run the company? And also, are you providing good value to the client? Um, and at the end of the day, that's all that, all that you can really do. I don't know if they're doing a job for their clients. I have, I have clients come to us that say, you know, we work with another podcast booking agency, it didn't work out. They were doing a terrible job. And that was something actually that Jordan Harbinger had mentioned to us when he came to us, <laughs> which is a little fearful of working with him because he had mentioned that he came from another agency that had done a terrible job and, you know, and he was coming to work with us. So, but I never, I never asked them, you know, who did you work with? Cause you know, who knows if, you know, I know it just really makes me feel uncomfortable when I say, you know, who did you work with? Who was doing a bad job? Who, yes, I would like to know to be like, Oh yeah, you know, we're doing a better job for them. But at the end of the day, really just trying to focus on what we can do and, and what our company can manage. So you have to tell us how you are able to find these successful entrepreneurs. For example, like John Dumas, right? Um, how are you able to communicate? And of course, give the incentive for that high level entrepreneur to be on your show. So one is just doing a ton of research on the show. And then also just sort of hitting them from every outlet, reaching out to them on email, reaching out to them on Facebook, direct messaging them, on Instagram. And again, you know, it really comes down to what, what are the, what's the value that you are providing the podcast host, especially some of these top tier podcasts. I was on one on a podcast the other day or two ago and, and he knows John Lee Dumas personally. And he said he gets 600 podcast pitches a month. So how are you going to make yourself stand out when there's 6,000 podcast pitches? So it comes down to what's the value that you're providing to the podcast host. So typically if we're pitching a client to John show, we want to make sure that the client has, you know, a, a substantial social media following, substantial email list. You would say, Hey John, if you, you know, obviously we'll go into how, how our client would benefit his audience, but we'll also say, if you have him on your show, he's going to share your interview together with his email list of hundred K subscribers and his 50 K 
followers on Instagram so that he's going to see that value. And that makes it a little bit easier. So they know that that person has a email list, has a social media following, because those are generally going to be the metrics that a lot of these top tier podcast hosts look at. So when you started your, your podcast, or when we're looking at other podcasts, how essential is an email list? Probably the number one thing. I wish I remember starting off and, and hearing people talk about, you know, email list is the number one thing that you have to have in your business. I was like, well, my company isn't that big. Why do I need to have one? Well, now that I realize that I really wish I started off from the beginning and it's the biggest thing because it's really the one source of traffic that you get that you own. Let's say you promote a Facebook post one day and all of a sudden Facebook doesn't like it and they ban your account for a month. Well, that, that <laughs> sucks. You know, what, what are you going to do? But at least if you have your email list of a thousand or 2000 people, you could send off an email to them and you can probably still make some revenue that way. So I think it gives you that control over some of your customers versus relying on some of these, these tech giants out there that can censor you for no, for no good reason. And you're kind of stuck there where at least having that email list, you own that traffic pretty much forever. So no matter how small or if you're just starting out your business, is that maybe one of the first steps you have to take creating oh, an email certainly. list? Most certainly. And I think that's a big thing is, you know, in the beginning, you know, it might feel a little weird. You might not know exactly how to do it. There's a couple of companies out there. I've, I've used MailChimp and I've used ConvertKit. Or I think Aweber was another one that I used. And I'd probably say out of all of them, I'd recommend ConvertKit. If you try it out, I think you can try it out for like 30, 30 days free trial. Check it out. Um, that's going to be the easiest one. That allows you to pull in subscribers from multiple different sources. So I definitely recommend using ConvertKit. I think it's like $29 a month, um, but it's a lot better than MailChimp. I think MailChimp, there's like a free version. You can even pay like $10 a month to get something decent. But when it comes mm -hmm. to really comes down to email marketing, I definitely recommend using ConvertKit. It's been one that's super beneficial from our company because we can pull people in um, from all different points of all over our website. So if we have a pop-up, if we have a free ebook, if we have a banner ad, we can pull people all in from our email to our email list from there. And then I mean, we just market them because again, our services are between three to $5,000 and the typical person that comes to us and hears about us probably isn't going to buy from us right away. So even when I have a client call, I'll put them on the email list and then email market to them, you know, send them something in informational, you know, one, once to every two weeks. And then I find out that it's weird, you know, after a three to four month period of us emailing them all of a sudden, now they're ready to get booked on podcasts again. And we were constantly reminding them over and over again, you know, not so much about working with us, but just, you know, informal things. We'll say like, send them an article, how to be a great podcast guest, you know, top entrepreneurship podcast that you should listen to, you know, small little things like that, but that we're always in there sort of the back of the mind. So that eventually when they do have the capacity to go out there and, and want to spend money on podcasts, they'll come back to our company versus if we had a conversation with them and we stopped it at that and we never went back to them, you know, there's a good chance that we're going to lose that lead. Now, I think you mentioned before uh, we started recording that you work on your blog and I feel that a lot of the sexy things nowadays is really social media, right? Just using mm -hmm. social media, getting followers on that. But I think what a lot of entrepreneurs don't really talk about as much is of course the email, having your own email list because that's an asset and not too many people talk about blogs. Now, is that something that you implement as well? Because of course, if you're ranked on Google and someone, you know, literally searches a specific keyword, you ideally want to be ranked number one. Is that something that you're very, at least in your business, um, very incentivized to do to really work on your blog and get ranked? Almost certainly. And I would say pretty much probably over the last six months or so, I just wanted it to, I realized our company wasn't showing up on Google um, when you type in like podcast booking agencies. And honestly, that's, that's obviously, obviously an issue. And I just wanted to make our company rank up there so that people could see us. And I realized that really over the last, it's been weird, like over the last month after putting about probably six months worth of putting content out there. Now all of a sudden I'm getting leads in and on hmm. when people apply to work with our company, I, I put a little question that says, how did you hear about us? And a lot of times we're getting people coming to us that say Google search, you know, they found us online and, and all of those are coming in. So like now it's starting to pay off, but I mean, for our competition, there's, you know, I'm, there's probably about five to 10 competitors. So it's not as hard to rank if you have a social media marketing agency, I'm sure it's going to be a lot harder, but I think it is a key component in putting content out there. And the cool thing is, is it allows you, you can just send it out to your email list, which is an added benefit. You can create a Facebook post behind it. A little bit harder to put it out on Instagram, but again, you can use it on multiple forms of content and put it out there. And, you know, I think it does allow at least our company to rank a little bit higher when it comes to SEO and it allows us mm -hmm. to be a little bit more visible. So do you think that for every or any service company really, or maybe an e-commerce shop that it's almost essential or at least important to have a blog? 
Oh, most certainly. And, and if you don't want to do it yourself, you know, I remember early on, I would hire someone before having my team do it. I would hire someone on Fiverr. I would pay her $17 and she would write like a thousand word blog post and she would do all the keyword research and everything. <laughs> so if you don't want to do it, if you just wanted to pay her, say, I don't know, $30, $40 a month to write two articles and just throw them on your blog, you know, you can most certainly do that. So it doesn't have to be a total time constraint. If you do have the money, you can go out there and work with someone like that. But again, you know, it, it's just super beneficial to our company. You know, when it comes to, we're doing SEO, we're doing email marketing, we're doing um, cold email marketing, we're doing podcast ads, you know, it's almost like we're funneling everyone in into our company and not just relying on social media. Oh yeah. I think the more nets you have out there to capture attention, the better, right? Um, now in terms of, I feel that you have to know to some extent, some sales here because you know, the inbound leads that are coming in or the people that you have to pitch your services to, they may say no now, but the things that you're providing value, right? And at some point in the future, they might want to be on a couple of podcasts, mm -hmm. right? So yep. even if they say no, you have their contact information. Um, do you have a strategy to really follow up so that when they are ready and they're thinking about being on a podcast, the first person they think about is you? Oh, most certainly. So one is after the call, I always just send them a recap email. Um, you know, unless they, unless it's like, we just determine it's not a fit. And I just feel like I just, sometimes I'll hop on a sales call. I'm like, I just don't want to work with this person. <laughs> and, it, and it just happens. So I don't, I don't send them over any information, but if I do want to work with them and it seems like a good fit, I'll send them a quick recap. Even if like, I spoke to one guy um, a little while ago and he's not going to be ready until like June, but I want to be that podcast company that's going to work with him in June. Um, you know, obviously that's a long ways away. So with him, put him on the email list, send him an email about once, um, once, the, once a week, once every two weeks. And then again, I'll reach out to my team's client relations manager. And what she'll do is she'll follow up with them about every two months until we get all the way up to June. She'll say, Hey, Ted, checking in, seeing how everything's going. You just want to see how your week's going. Just there's something small like that. And then, you know, you'll, they'll have a nice little back and forth. And then she'll set up another reminder in her calendar two months, two months later, reach back out to him. And I can't tell you how many times we've, I've spoken with someone and then all of a sudden eight months down the road, they're finally ready to work with us by using that follow-up technique. And that's been a big thing for us is really just following up with the person over and not, not like being a pest with them, not following up with them every week, but just being like, Hey, you know, once, once a month, once every couple months, being like, Hey, checking in and see how everything's going. <laughs> just trying to keep yourself top of mind is definitely going to allow you um, to stand out to them and sort of be on the top of their mind when they finally are ready to purchase from you. Oh yeah. I think that's such a great idea because I mean, the people that I've spoken to in terms of sales, they're like, look, if someone says no, it's never, they never mean no. It's, mm -hmm. it's a yes in the future eventually. Right. You just gotta be, mm -hmm. make, you gotta make sure that you're in their mind subconsciously. Right. That's a, that's the number one thing here. Um, now how many clients or how many people have you, uh, booked in total since the start of podcasting you? So we've probably worked with probably close to 150 clients now. Um, over the last three years and then probably podcasts, it's probably well over last time I like actually ran the numbers is about a year ago and it was over a thousand podcasts between all of them. So probably Sheesh. this year, probably be about over 2000 podcasts. Um, again, that's why I'm glad I'm having a team and not having to book all those, <laughs> all those 2000 shows. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely been a lot, um, from just pitching all of our clients and over the last couple of years. That just goes to show how many podcasts there are. Has there been times where you have different clients going on to the same shows? Oh, most certainly. There's, there's some podcasts that just accept every client, every client that we have, as long as it's like, like we work with a lot of real estate investors and yeah. there's some real estate investing shows that are good quality shows. But let's say one is an example. It's the best real estate investing ever show with Joe Fairless. He has one of the top ranked real estate investing podcasts out there, but he puts out one podcast interview every single day of the week. So that we know that he needs guests, you know, he's, he doesn't want to go out there and, and find 365 guests a year. So that's one show where we're pretty much able to get the majority of our clients on as long as, you know, again, they're a good fit. So there's always these podcast hosts that we like to take care of. We want to make sure that we're doing a good job for them, recommending good clients to them. And, and they sort of book our clients over and over and over again, which, which makes our job a lot easier when, you know, when we take on a client, being able to get them booked on shows right away is going to show our value to them. And and show them that we're serious so that they don't work with us and have to wait like a month or two before we even get them on one show. No, that, that's definitely a win, win, win scenario mm -hmm. there because number one, of course, your client is happy that to be on the podcast, right? Of course, you know, the guy having a podcast every single day, it does get tiresome of booking mm -hmm. one or DMing people every day. And of course you find the show that you need 
Um, so it's kind of a good connection there. Now, how much revenue have you generated in, in total so far? Yep. So I would probably say in total, probably about 250, 300. Um, first hmm. year wasn't, wasn't that much. It was like 10,000. <laughs> and then second year was about uh, 50,000. And then now we've, you know, we've really taken off this year, um, you know, in quite a, quite a way. Um, so really just, really just started small, really that first year, that 10,000 sort of looked at it as a hobby. And then in the second year, I was like, I was still in college the second year, which is probably why I haven't been able to, I wasn't able to get it that much. And, and then really that second year, I was like, wait a second, people can pay for the service. And then now looking into the third year, I can see that changing our pricing strategy has really what has allowed us to really, you know, almost quadruple that number um, in revenue. So it's a, it's a huge learning curve along the way. I mean, nothing linear in, in business kind of exponential at some point. Almost certainly any, it's looking at the business, you know, that's always ups and downs. It's, it's always trying to figure out like even what clients do we want to work with? We've worked with, you know, an array of clients. We took them all on. We've worked with politicians. We worked with lawyers and we worked with people. I remember one guy, he was, uh, he coaches families on how to coach their kids in sports, which was a very, very niche down topic. And I realized that not, not all niches in the podcasting space are, are created equal. You know, when it came to pitch, like the guy who wanted to go on pol- political podcasts, like, I probably have to pitch like 30 shows just to get them one yes, where in the real estate space, if I pitch a client to five shows, I'll probably get one yes. And it's, it's a lot easier. So it's all trial and error and really figuring out what works for our company. Again, you know, it's up and down and, and sort of figuring out along the way. I think anyone that's starting a company, when you look back at your first year, it's going to be way different than when you look back, you know, a couple of years down the road. And I think even looking at our company now, what it looks like, you know, we're three years in now, what it's going to look like five years in is going to be a, uh, it's going to be a lot different than what it is currently right now. So do you recommend for any entrepreneur, like you said, your first year was $10,000 and you know, not everyone can have that somewhat success. Maybe they don't make any money at all, but you think you have to be patient at least for the first year and then continue grinding out. If not, if it's, if nothing's working out, then at least pivot, don't quit. Oh, most certainly. I think like even going, even going prior to that, like selling those phone cases, you know, losing that 80 bucks and then and selling those bracelets and watches and, and working like 20 hours a week on that and probably making no more than a hundred dollars a month and then running become the lion and, and actually losing money in that company, you know, but just looking at like every, every company that you run is, is going to get you to that end point someday, which, you know, for me right now, it just happens to be podcasting you. And I think too many entrepreneurs start and they see these people that made a million dollars in one year, or maybe, you know, a hundred thousand dollars this month. And those are just crazy numbers. Those are going to be the outliers. When you talk to really anyone that's gone off and, and started a business, and, re- and really, really tried to do it. There's a lot of work that comes into it. So to have those expectations that you can start a million dollar company in one year, having no connections, having really built no skills, you know, and not really having a company set up, you know, it's almost crazy. So I think the expectation should be that you're not going to be making that much in the first year and, and sort of use that first year as a learning experience. For sure. And of course, going back to personal branding and now everyone wants to be on social media and, and podcasting. Now, where do you think the true incentives are? Because not everyone knows this, you know, not every entrepreneur knows this, but how important is it nowadays to really build up a personal brand? Oh, most certainly. If anyone wants to become a thought leader in their space, you know, I can tell you, I mean, at least for me personally, I'll, I'll listen to a couple of different business podcasts. And as soon as I hear someone on say like the Mike Dillard show, which is one I really listen to, I'll go check the guy out on social media. I'll follow him. If he has a book, I'll almost likely buy it if, if he was a good enough host. And, and all of a sudden, if I see someone on Mike Dillard's show and then John Lee Dumas and, and all these different podcasts that are out there, then all of a sudden, I just think of him as a thought leader. And I think that's where people allows them to build a personal brand is all of a sudden, if you're a real estate investor and all of a sudden you're on 20 real estate investing shows, you know, people are probably going to say, you know, this guy must know something, you know, all these shows want to have him on. And same thing with the entrepreneur, if all of a sudden, you haven't done one podcast and over a six month period, you've done 30 to 50 interviews. People are going to look at you and be like, well, obviously this person knows something they're going on. These similar podcasts that I listen to on a weekly basis, you know, he obviously knows something. And I think it builds that sort of no like and trust factor where someone can come to you. And if that podcast host is having you on, there's always a reason there's some value that they found in you. And then I think that person's going to see that value in, your, in them as well. Um, so again, I think it really is, is big for building that personal brand. Oh yeah, no doubt about that. And now what's your ambition as an entrepreneur, a business owner? Now, do you want to continue scaling podcast you, or do you want to maybe go on to different routes? So what's your ambition? Continue scaling podcast you, but the ultimate end goal is 
is to really build a company where I'm, I'm making passive income from it, where podcasting you, it's not really that passive. It's, you know, I'm always having to go out there and get new clients to generate more money, to bring in more revenue. So it's not as passive as, as I would like. But on the other hand, I work with a lot of real estate investor clients. So I think eventually one day I'd like to really go into real estate investing because I see a lot of them, you know, they make crazy amounts of money <laughs> and money and real estate investing. So, I mean, that's the way I would probably look at it and how to build up my passive income stream is, is investing um, in real estate. So that's really my goal is to eventually take the money that I'm making from podcasting you, saving it up so I could really start to go out there and, and make some money in real estate investing and, and sort of build up that passive income stream. Cause I don't think I, would, I don't think I would want to do it forever. You know, I don't know if I'd want to be taking client calls and, and 20 years and still working to get people booked on podcasts. Eventually the goal is to just having that passive income so I can really choose whether or not I want to work. You think it's possible or maybe it's your plan all along to really have an exit strategy in selling podcasting you? I think maybe someday, I think probably for right now, just keep them going. I mean, I enjoy it. You know, it's really the, probably the first company that I've started that's actually seen like very good monetary success. So it's almost like, almost like my baby. So I think <laughs> it would be hard. But I mean, if someone came along and said, Hey, I'll offer you $10 million for it. Then, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have any, any problem with selling it. So I think, you know, I think if there's a point in time in my life where I, I really just don't want to get people booked on podcasts anymore, I don't enjoy it. And someone comes along with the right offer, which at this point for me, would probably have to be in the millions um, to make me really want to sell it and, and give it up. But if that came along, then I'd be more than happy to sell it and then sort of figure out uh, to start something new. Mm -hmm. And another important topic that I want to really discuss real quick is that, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, um, of course, when you made your, your, your money, you basically paid off your student debt, which is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Of course, you want to get out of that as soon as possible, but other entrepreneurs, if they have no debt, they don't really reinvest in the business and maybe they can buy material things, which is nothing wrong with that. But if you want to scale your business, of course you have to reinvest in it. Now in your personal journey, in your, in your personal case, um, how does your, kind of lifestyle? What do you do in terms of money? Do you reinvest back into the business? Do you like to buy materialistic things, et cetera? Sure. So what I'll do is, is looking at like a typical client. If they say they pay us $5,000 on, on a package, take about a thousand, put it away into business savings so that my client, um, so that I can pay my team members for doing that work, take about a thousand, put it away for taxes. So now I'm left with about 3000 at that point, typically put away about 50% of that, put it into investments. So I'll put it into a Roth IRA or a brokerage account and then take that other 1500 and reinvest it back into the company. So I like to just split it up um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, between saving money for myself, because I don't want to just be taking everything I make in the company yeah. and reinvesting it and back into it. So I want to save some for myself. So really after paying my employees and paying the taxes, just saving, taking about 50% of it, putting it towards investments and then taking that other 50% um, and putting it back towards the company and growing it. And I, and I find that's sort of the happy medium for me where I still feel like I'm making money and I'm not just spending all of it, putting it back into the company. Cause you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work to run a company. I don't want to just continuing to grow and grow it and, and not be able to enjoy it at the end of the day. Oh, for sure. For sure. And do you have a, you know, a separate pile just to save up for a real estate opportunity to invest in something? I do. Yep. So I just take a chunk, you know, okay, yeah. from, you know, from clients again that come in, you know, if I don't want to invest in real estate, if I don't see any op or invest in the stock market, if I don't see any opportunities, I'll just put it away for real estate investing and, and sort of build that nest egg um, up there. And, you know, I've done, done some research in the space. I kind of see what I want to do. Um, and typically the, the amount that's going to require that is about 50 K to really get started um, using my money. I, at this point, I don't want to, use, I don't want to borrow money and get, and get back and do a whole lot of debt after my, my student loan. So if I'm buying something, I want to be able to put, you know, 20 to 25% down. So just saving for that and putting that aside. But again, having the business has really helped me accelerate that. And again, increasing those prices has been probably the best thing I, I ever did. Again, not really working with those lower end clients that didn't really care about our services. The clients that have come in on those higher prices are a lot better. Yes, it's, it's harder to sell people. My conversion rates probably went from 75% down to 20, 20% but the clients coming in are a lot better. I'm making more money. It's just way more enjoyable. Wait, when you made that decision, were you kind of in the back of your mind? Like, you know what, man, like this is kind of scary because I can maybe scare some people off and I might lose a good portion of my business. Oh, it, it was, but I think at the same time, I'd been running the business for about two years. And I know if I ever wanted to build any sort of lifestyle for myself, I couldn't continue charging the prices that I did. And I think the first time I did it, I had like 15 sales calls in a month. And in that month I got no new clients. So that that was a little scary, but then I think in the, in the following month, I picked up like two or three new ones and it sort of reaffirmed me that, that people are willing to pay these prices. And then even now I've, I've gone up in prices since when we first started charging 
um, a more higher amount and people don't even bat an eye on it. And there's some people, it certainly makes the people that say, I can't afford it. I don't want to do it. I'm like, okay. And then I get the people that say, oh, no, not a problem. That's perfectly fine. Sounds like a good price to me. And I think it's really the person's personal preference um, who I'm talking to. So I know at the end of the day, there's going to be people who can afford it. There's going to be people who can't afford it. And then there's people who just never even wanted to do it in the first place. And there's always going to be a mix of those people. So I really just focusing on the people that can't afford the services. Cause I know that there's enough people out there. There's enough people with successful businesses that want to be heard, that want to build a brand that can't afford our prices. For sure. And are there any resources, podcasts, books that you recommend to any entrepreneurs to really learn about, you know, communication and building a team and growing and scaling a business? I'd say one is if you're thinking about starting a podcast, definitely recommend checking out Pat Flynn. When I started off my, I don't run a podcast now, but when I had first done it, he has tutorials on YouTube that he puts literally step-by-step on exactly how you can start a podcast, how the equipment, the editing, all that stuff that you need. So if you're thinking about starting a podcast, check out his tutorial. And then when it comes to building a business, highly recommend the book, The E-Myth um, by Michael Gerber. He goes into how to run your business so that you're not necessarily running in the day-to-day operations. You're more running, you know, looking at it from an outside perspective, which I found to be very beneficial, which basically for me means I'm not pitching clients. I have team members pitching clients and I'm more doing podcast interviews and, and sales calls. You know, that's going to be more beneficial to me where that team, my team is doing more of the, the day-to-day stuff. So it allows you just look at your company as a big picture and realize that, you have more opportunities because at the end of the day, I don't want to be pitching people every single day. I'd rather pass it off to my team. Um, and that book really helped me to see that. Yeah. So essentially you don't want to be an employee of your business. You want to do mm-hmm. things that move the needle, right? Yep, ex- exactly. And that was a big thing for me. And I think it's hard when you're starting off because you want to do everything on your own. Um, but the biggest thing for me was when I realized that, wow, I can hire people and they actually <laughs> write better podcast pitches than I do. I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty cool. When I hired someone to write blog posts for us, I was like, they do a better job than I do. And I realize that there's people that can do a lot better job than I can do. And, and almost everything that I think I can do, there's always someone better. Um, and finding those people is just going to push your company forward. Yeah. And it's, it is crazy. Just one final note is that there's a plethora of information to really help you out. Of course, if you didn't know about freelancing websites, you know, paying people five bucks for one task or for an hour to do pitches or for example, right. If you didn't know about that, then you're going to be stuck doing it every day. Whereas you could, if you did know about freelancing websites, then you can leverage that and you can work on things that move the needle instead of just being an employee of your own business. Oh, most certainly. And I can give you an example right now. I have the lady who does cold email marketing for us, who reaches out to these people on podcasts and says, Hey, you know, Hey, heard you. Do you want to work with our company? We got other people booked on podcasts, you know, sort of in a nutshell. I'll pay, I pay her, I think $5 an hour and she works 25 hours a week for our company. So I pay her what comes out to 450, you know, $500 a month, whatever the number may be. And we get a lot of leads coming in from that. And I wouldn't, I don't want to be sitting there behind my computer, going on to podcasts, finding the people's names, going to their website, finding their email, crafting the email, setting out the, like, that's not what I want to be doing with my time. And I can mm-hmm. leverage this person paying her $450, $500 a month. And she takes care of that for us. I'm leveraging her time. And that allows us to put our company forward. So I don't have to do those tasks and I can focus on sort of what I call the CEO tasks. Yeah. So just to kind of, reaffirm or summarize everything in the beginning i think it is going to be tough because you're going to do everything by yourself but eventually as you learn the ropes you'll be able to teach people how to do those tasks and you just focus on things that really push the company forward now trevor i don't want to take too much of your time here i think we learned a lot here if people want to learn more about you um learn more about podcasting you where can they where can they find that Sure. So they can go to our website, podcasting you. So that's podcasting com. They can check, uh, check us out on Instagram. They can check me out on Instagram. It's just at Trevor Oldham. Um, they can check. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn as well. So they can check me out. again, my name, Trevor Oldham on LinkedIn. And, and then those generally give you the places that you can find out more about myself or about our company. Awesome. So if anyone is interested or curious, I'll put that in the show notes. They can click on that message you on, on Instagram or add you on LinkedIn. Perfect. Thank you. Trevor, it was a pleasure, man. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate you. And, and thank you again for your audience. And I appreciate them taking the time to listen to the interview. For sure. So I'll let you know once the podcast can be uploaded. Usually it takes about a week, but this time I'm kind of backtracked. And usually I upload a podcast once a day, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's going to take maybe 12 days from now. Yep, no your worries. podcast will be good. It sounds perfect. Mm-hmm. And I want to make the clips. I'll obviously tag you in them as well. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I'll make sure I'll, what I'll do is I send them over to our team and then they just 
put it out um, to our email list and, and our social media accounts as well. Okay. And do you want the raw files as well? Um, so typically we, we don't, if you just, ha if you just create like a little bit, like I noticed like on, on your Instagram, we have like little bits um, for like, looks like other interviews. If you just send that along to our team, we can just take that and, and send it out there, which is perfect. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank right, you. Trevor. Have a good one. All right. All take right. care. Thank you. You too. Thank you.